So Inga, please start after five seconds. Hello, welcome everyone. Welcome to the second e-conference of ERI. We're very proud of it. And I would like to uh, uh, introduce you um, the head of ERI, the director of ERI, which is uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Eliav Ephraim. Um, he's a PhD on Tel Aviv. He works at the Tel Aviv University of Israel. And he will first give a short introduction about ERI and uh, will also uh, speak for us about the research on the phenomenon of consciousness on the basis of an integral science paradigm. So please go ahead. Thank you very much, Inger, for the introduction. I, I will share my screen. And I'll share my presentation. <clears throat> so hello, everyone. I would like to also welcome you on our second International Scientific Electronical Conference. The title of our conference is Solving the Global Problems of uh, Modernity Through Integration in uh, Society, Science and Culture. And uh, uh, the goals of the conference is the following. First of all, we would like to consolidate the efforts of scholars, educators, and specialists in scientific integral uh, approach in revealing unity of the laws of nature, society, and human development. And the second purpose is just to ensure the proper ways of uh, strategic development of uh, society and harmonization of social ties, relationships, development of the integral methodology and approaches for education and management. In particular, in our very complicated time of, of the epoch of global crises caused by the uh, pandemic disease. Uh, we have uh, 20 speakers, presenters from uh, almost all corners of our world from Asia, Africa, Europe, North America. And we hope that during our next uh, electronic conference, which will be after half a year, we will have representatives of the all six uh, uh, continents, including uh, Australia and South America. So the uh, lectures that we will hear during our uh, con uh, conference, they are from all different kinds of specialities. We have scientists and university uh, lectures, both from the humanitarians and the uh, natural science fields. We have engineers, business entrepreneurs, clerks, medical doctors, journalists, artists, students. And we expect it that there will be about uh, 20,000 social media links to our uh, conference. They are broadcasting channels, I mean the YouTube and the Facebook uh, channels. Now I would like to uh, just uh, describe to you what is the uh, integral sci scientific worldview that uh, our institute is trying to develop and to implement. Uh, uh, the scientific uh, worldview is uh, based on the uh, three actually basic points. First of all, we are trying to develop the uh, scientific uh, paradigm, which is based on the worldview that our world is integral. Our uh, reality is integral. It means that it is interconnected, interdependent, casual, uh, purposeful, and uh, synerg synergetic. And I will talk more about this point during my 
spatial presentation. The second point is that um, uh, we're trying to develop in uh, practice in our institute so-called integral and collective perception of uh, reality. And I will also uh, give some short um, explanation of what it is during my talk. And the second point is that uh, in the, the third, last point is that we are trying to develop uh, integral forms of education and social management based on these two uh, paradigms. And now I would like to proceed to my uh, scientific uh, presentation, which is called the problem of consciousness on the basis of the integral scientific uh, paradigm. So from uh, uh, my very child, ch childhood, I actually started to ask uh, uh, questions concerning the outside world and especially about the consciousness. The, uh, the heart, what is the world like, what it is made of, why and how people are feeling and uh, thinking who am I, what am my mind and my brain, how they are connected, what is consciousness, why people hate and laugh. And actually, uh, I started to think that I need to be a scientist, a scholar, in order to answer to all these questions, especially I accounted on chemistry because I thought that it is actually the proper way to investigate the world around me. So, uh, actually, uh, all my scientific uh, career, I tried to answer to this question, but uh, the questions about uh, our consciousness still cannot be answered. Also, um, you know that uh, in uh, uh, modern time, consciousness has become a significant topic of the most interdisciplinary research uh, in philosophy, co cognitive science, anthropology, sociology, lin lin linguistic, uh, biology, chemistry, physics, math, you name it. I mean, all almost all a scientific discipline tried to solve the problem of uh, consciousness, but still there are no clear understanding or even definition of this uh, uh, phenomenon, which is suitable for all the uh, disciplinary. So the problem of consciousness is really hard. And I would like also to quote um, one of the most uh, under, uh, outstanding specialists and the research in this field, Professor uh, Chernigovska from uh, St. Petersburg University, Russia. And she told that uh, the more we study the consciousness, the less we understand it. And it is actually true. Uh, so uh, we have a clear need for the changing of the very scientific paradigm in order to really study this uh, uh, phenomena. And uh, uh, what kind of um, uh, uh, clue we can get from our outstanding sci scientists if we would like to solve this uh, uh, pro pro problem, you know, Albert Einstein told that it is impossible to solve the problem at the same level as it is originated. So you need to be higher. You need to rise in the next level of uh, the same uh, consciousness. He's uh, uh, one of the best friends, uh, Kurt Gödel, and you see both of them on this photo. He just uh, makes some kind of scientific joke. He 
uh, told about human beings that uh, a handful of atoms cannot fully understand them, themselves. It, it means that we really need to rise at least one level of consciousness high in order just to investigate what is our personal uh, consciousness. And there are also some hints that we are getting from uh, nature. How should we investigate this hard phen phenomenon? And one, uh, the, the first hint is a uh, property which is called syn synergy. You know that uh, uh, there are four uh, levels of uh, matter organization in uh, nature. We have uh, uh, steel, vegetable, animate, and human le levels. Actually, uh, the same uh, pyramid we can draw for the uh, desires, which is actually part of the uh, consciousness. And I will return to this point later. But for the time being, I would like to just uh, make clear what is the uh, synergy on some example of uh, inanimate level on the chemistry. You, hear, you see here the molecule of water and water is made of three atoms. Uh, this is example from chemistry, from my uh, speciality. And uh, we have three atoms which are joining uh, together to organize actually the new uh, unity, the new sub sub substance, which is called molecule. And we know that the uh, property of molecule of water is very, very different of the uh, pro pro properties of atoms which uh, uh, consist in this, which are uh, co combined to organize these uh, molecules. And this is uh, precisely the property of the synergy when entire system cannot be described as a simple sum of the uh, of its uh, components. And if we go to the more high level, to animal uh, to animal level, then please guess what uh, do you see now? I can show you another picture in order probably to help you. Uh, maybe not, but uh, the answer is very simple. You see actually the very huge anfield. So uh, this is an example when this uh, small, uh, very uh, wonderful insects are building uh, so enormous and large and complex uh, construction, which is similar to the uh, city. They have all, all the uh, city services there, like uh, we humans have. They have uh, uh, different kind of uh, uh, services, like uh, 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 city clean, clean, cleaning, uh, uh, police, etc., etc., etc. So uh, this is also uh, the example of um, the uh, synergetic connections of this insect in one uh, unity, which is called the uh, unheal. And is this unheal? Uh, unheal has consciousness which is actually uh, much on, on much higher than individual uh, intelligence of each and every insect which is which is inside this um, un unity and if we are talking about uh, the synergy then we have a very nice quote of Mark Twain which is called that uh, synergy is the bonus 
that it is achieved when things work together in harmony. So here we are talking human beings. Then uh, I should say that many uh, uh, evolutional bi biologists and uh, anthropologists, when uh, they're talking about human beings, they also told that um, the evolution of human beings is not uh, finished yet. And the next step should probably be the same uh, human anhill like we have in the case of um, ants, because uh, there are many, uh, uh, many indications that we actually are uh, the same, which, which, that we humans also are super organism, like the super organism as the anhill is. But uh, the point is that we don't know how to organize this uh, human super organism. Uh, the evolution now, uh, biologists and the psychologists and other specialists, they don't know how to make possible this uh, uh, synergy connections that the uh, ants can organize and we human being still cannot. And uh, uh, we have another hints from uh, nature, how probably we should uh, proceed to these uh, synergy connections uh, between us in order to rise to the next uh, level of consciousness. And this is uh, the symmetry. Uh, actually, uh, our nature uh, prefer two different kind of uh, symmetries. The first is uh, spherical symmetry or circular symmetry, and the second is uh, linear uh, symmetry. This is the two main symmetries in nature and all uh, different uh, objects in uh, uh, micro cause or macro cause they actually explore this symmetry like uh, atoms or uh, molecules for instance the molecular molecular structure of uh, DNA that you see now it uh, has in a co combination two symmetries the circle symmetry and the uh, linear sym symmetry and if you're talking about the periodic table of uh, elements, then uh, it is amazing, but uh, probably it will be much better to put it in the circle. In this case, you will see the chemical and physical properties of many elements much more clear, and also interconnections between all these uh, properties. But you, you really can see the uh, round uh, symmetry or circle symmetry or spherical symmetry really in many, many cases. For instance, this is the uh, elementary uh, particle uh, round box where you can see them in the proper order. <clears throat> we are talking about our universe, uh, big scale, then the form of uh, planets, of uh, stars, of entire galaxies also has this uh, sym sym symmetry. We have uh, many, example for, uh, many examples from uh, life uh, sy sy systems as well. And what about our human beings? How we should explore this uh, clue from the nation in order to really uh, make this uh, uh, proper syn syn synergetic organization link organization uh, between us. And here we are coming to the next hint from the uh, point of view of uh, theory of information. You know, we are living in a time when uh, more than uh, picture that physics gives us about our, the most um, fundamental uh, building blocks in nature as we are th thinking about the 
matter, like el elementary particles and, and wave. Actually, physicists uh, nowadays are saying that they are not actually uh, the uh, pieces of matter, but actually uh, they are uh, con considered all these elementary objects, uh, nothing else, but uh, being the uh, special topological or informational structures of vacuum, of nothingness. So we can see that uh, uh, we're living in a very strange world where the uh, matter is uh, and the energy is nothing else but the uh, informational uh, blocks. So we can use this uh, uh, clue also to uh, make some uh, uh, promotion of what we we are uh, de developing the integral scientific uh, paradigm and the use the uh, fun fun fundamental concepts in, in laws in all human knowledge and perception of reality in the terms of information. And if we are, if we will use it, then we are coming to the integral uh, paradigm. And I have only a couple of minutes just to show you what it is. So integral uh, paradigm is really used the informational uh, fun, fun, uh, fun fundamental building blocks for its structure. It builds on the property of uh, integrality. Uh, unfortunately, I have no time to, to describe it. It, it is also used to build uh, on the property of uh, resonance structure of the uh, interaction of uh, different informational st structures. It is also used, uh, should use the property of sphericity and uh, linearity in order to be suitable to the most uh, fundamental laws of um, uh, conservation in nature. And it should be used so-called minimax principle as the foundation of its law of, of the foundation of law of uh, evolution. And the most uh, ideal informational structure to to uh, suit to suits all these demands are desires. So uh, the desire is she should be uh, just um, uh, formulated as the informational structure which is uh, ready for informational exchange, receiving or giving, caused by in inadequate informational feeling or informational imbalance with environment. And uh, we also need to make some uh, pra practical application of this uh, par par paradigm and what our uh, uh, institute is trying to develop is uh, really trying to implement all this um, uh, all this uh, par paradigm into the uh, perception of uh, reality. So we're trying to develop so-called the uh, common or collective uh, uh, organs for the perception of uh, uh, reality and what does it mean in, uh, pra in practice. Uh, so we need to uh, make a special uh, group uh, uh, methodology, which is based on integral education, and all this should, should, should be planned and uh, fulfilled in the special steps. We need to develop so-called mutual uh, guarantee and uh, and circular net network uh, support in our. Uh, society. We need to work as a team. Uh, we need to use uh, roundtable sem seminars and brainstorming, collective uh, games, joint meals, and so-called social activity to uh, practice our 
uh, methodology. And uh, uh, very, very important, we need to have constant secular discussions about the importance uh, and the ways of reaching the common goal, creating a universal human superorganism in the next level of conscious and uh, uh, purposeful human evolution. And this is my last uh, slide where I am just ensuring you that this level of uh, synergy, of synergetic connections uh, between people should really needs uh, should really lead not only to the upper level of consciousness but to the complete harmony in human uh, society and nature thank you very much and please uh, probably there are a couple of questions Thank you very much, Professor Ephraim, for this wonderful presentation. Um, indeed, are there questions? Uh, we don't have much time, but please, if there is a burning question, uh, now is the time. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Yes, yes. is the Institute going to dedicate a special um, research about the desires or this will be something common for all the researchers to research desires yes actually we are really plan planning to organize a special research team to devote to this uh, uh, particular question because uh, if we really want to develop a full-scale theory and uh, implement it in uh, practice, then we need to have very ser serious scientific investigation, what it is uh, uh, desires and how it uh, functioning in a, a small team and larger team and all the human uh, society. Thank you. Are there more questions, please? Okay, well, thank you very, very much. It was extremely interesting. Uh, we'll go to our next presenter, which is Dr. Valeria Kachaturian uh, from Russia, PhD in history, senior researcher, uh, Institute of General History and Russian Academy of Sciences. The presentation will be about the problem of the future in modern science and the formation of integral futurology. Please go ahead. Добрый вечер. Мой доклад посвящен проблемам будущего, которые в наши дни вызывают особый повышенный интерес и в научных кругах, и в средствах массовой информации, и в массовом сознании. Будущее давно уже стало объектом дискуссий и исследований. И это, безусловно, в первую очередь объясняется тем сложным переходным периодом, в который вступило современное человечество. Ритм исторических изменений возрастает по экспоненте, и последствия э, трансформаций в социальной реальности – совершенно неочевидны. Многочисленные глобальные проблемы усиливают ощущение глобальной неопределенности. Разрушается наиболее характерное для человека представление о том, что завтра будет похоже на сегодня. Вполне естественно, что в этой сложной ситуации очень востребованной является футурология или «futures studies». Относительно молодая наука, зародившаяся примерно в 60-х годах 20 -го века. 
футурология занимается по преимуществу глобальным долгосрочным прогнозированием, то есть создает сценарии будущего всего человечества. И перед этой наукой сейчас стоят крайне важные задачи. Она должна определить характер и результаты грядущих перемен, подготовить к ним индивида и общества, дать новые ориентиры и цели социальной деятельности. И, конечно, разработать рекомендации, как избежать глобальных рисков и создать хорошее будущее. В какой степени футурология, вот такая, какой она сейчас и какая она сейчас есть, способна выполнить эти задачи? В какой степени точны и обоснованы прогнозы предсказаний и рекомендации? За 60 лет своего существования футурология, безусловно, добилась больших успехов. Она зарекомендовала себя именно в качестве науки, вошла в состав социальных дисциплин, разработала свои методы исследования. И я хочу напомнить, что именно футурологи впервые еще в 70-х годах прошлого столетия привлекли внимание мирового сообщества к глобальным проблемам. Я имею в виду доклады Римскому клубу. И тем не менее, футурология пока не добилась высокого авторитета, и часто отношение к ней весьма скептическое. С чем это связано? Прогнозы предостережения по поводу глобальных проблем, экологических или техногенных катастроф уже давно были сделаны. Однако это нисколько не изменило ситуацию нарастания глобального кризиса. Вспомним знаменитый доклад «Пределы роста», первый доклад Римскому клубу, его авторы предложили резко сократить производство и потребление, особенно в преуспевающих странах, изменить образ жизни и систему ценностей. Эти и другие сходные рекомендации, которые были призваны остановить развитие кризисных процессов, так и не были реализованы поскольку они требовали слишком больших трансформаций, слишком больших жертв. В наши дни, как считают социологи и психологи, вот такие пессимистические прогнозы, предупреждения вызывают чаще всего негативную реакцию, реакцию отторжения. С другой стороны, не подтвердились или подтвердились лишь отчасти более оптимистические прогнозы, предсказания, авторы которых делали ставку на научно-технический прогресс. В частности, не подтвердились многие идеи Элвина Тофлера, который утверждал, что третья волна в истории цивилизации, связанная с ведущей ролью науки, внедрением информационных технологий, исправить недостатки общества второй волны, то есть общества индустриального. Даже компьютерное математическое моделирование, которое позволяет вводить много переменных, обрабатывать огромное количество статистических данных, не помогло создать точные и сбывающиеся прогнозы будущего. В математических моделях, оказывается, присутствует и субъективный фактор, то есть идейные предпочтения ученого, Кроме того, любые прогнозы, как выяснилось, могут не реализоваться из-за так называемых диких карт, wild cards. Это непредсказуемые, крайне редкие, маловероятные события, которые, тем не менее, происходят иногда и могут радикально изменить всю жизнь общества. Не менее важны и слабые сигналы социальные процессы и структуры, которые находятся на периферии жизни общества, они почти незаметны. Но с течением времени они могут оттеснить те тенденции, которые мы считаем ведущими, на которых мы строим свои прогнозы, и неожиданно выйти на первый план. Вместе с тем это может и не произойти. То есть слабый сигнал может оказаться не предвестником будущего, а незначительной девиацией. Конечно, прогнозирование в том виде, в каком оно сейчас существует, сталкивается с очень большими проблемами. Кризис долгосрочного прогнозирования, разочарование в нем, 
послужил импульсом для разработки новых и, по-моему, очень плодотворных подходов к изучению будущего. В современных Futures Studies появились идеи, которые, с моей точки зрения, имеют большую и практическую, и эвристическую ценность. Прежде всего, это идея о том, что человек способен конструировать желаемое будущее. The future should not be predicted by cre but created. This is the motto of many futurologists who rely on the concept of constructivism by sociologists Luckman and Berger and emphasize the role of transforming human society. Nowadays, this idea is supported and given a theoretical foundation and synergies in the air bifurcations and polyfurcations, for example, branching paths of development of complex systems of particular importance are fluctuations, small fluctuations which are determined in social systems by actions, life goals and values of individuals. In this regard, great importance is attached to the images of the future, our ideas about the future, and are capable of influencing to one degree or another the future itself, creating a feedback, for example, decreasing or increasing the likelihood of a particular scenario. This, uh, uh, this is explained by the fact that the image of the future, even if, if the individual is not aware of it, influence, influences his behavior, the fluctuation that I mentioned before. The problem, however, is that the number of alternative scenarios is very large. Civilization wars, Hunt, by Huntington, a global catastrophe that will return humanity to the primitive level, global totalitarian society or liberal networked world, technocratic utopias, the resentment of people to other resettlement of people to other planets, transhumanist, transhumanistic scenario of human improvement through biotechnology and many others. There are many others that I have mentioned. According to uh, what is the, the desired future we need to construct? Uh, I would like to emphasize that uh, the, the variety of images of the future that exist in the same time indicates the instability of society in confusion before the coming changes. Uh, but most importantly, it's unclear what kind of desired future should be designed. It should be emphasized that is a, a variety of probable scenarios of the future are the impossibility of determining which of them is being, re, is being realized. The principal, the principal position of many modern futures, uh, the, this position makes the idea of constructing the desired future impractical because there are too many models that do not agree with each other and sharply reduces the predictive capabilities of future studies, which from my point of view indicates another crisis of this science, which never came to the expected, the level of planning the, to the future. It obvious that modernization is required, first of all, of the theoretical and methodological, methodological base of urology. This task can be fulfilled by a new emerging integral approach which is being developed in philosophy, including in the works of Ashlag and Michael Leitman in systemology, synergist, synergetics, global uh, evolutionism, co-evolution theory. What are the futures and advantages of this approach, which open a new stage of the development of futurology? The problem of the future is considered in the broadest possible context, the general 
picture of the universe. It's universal laws and global evolution of which social evolution is a part. Only the study of the principles of functioning and development of natural and social systems make it possible to give grounded scenarios of the future. Integral futurology was sharing in general the idea of possibility of constructing the desired future, nevertheless believes that these possibilities are by no means limitless. Let us turn to the well-known synergetics who believe that not all scenarios can be realized, but only those that correspond to the direction of the internal development of the social system, its, predet its predetermined capabilities. Therefore, any voluntaristic attempts at, at design or forecasting that do not take this factor into account are doomed to failure. What is the predetermined direction of the development of society? It is determined by integrity, interpretation, interinclusion, mutual consistency, and self similarity of all the elements that make up the system. This fundamental principle of the structure of the universe, organization, and evolution of all its subsystems is revealed by post non classic science. Thus, it, it can be said that, which, with certain reservations, that the evolution of natural and social systems is pur purposeful and, de and determined by their own internal properties, the integrality regionally contained in them, which is revealed in the course of development. The term evolution accordingly approaches its original meaning unfolding although it's not reduced to it. The idea of predestination is associated with the idea that present is determined not only by the past, by also by the future is completed from the future thanks to structures attractors it's it's a very popular idea these days and researched by uh, synergetics the structure attractor is the global of the self-development of the things its path to itself Hence, the feeling that the process of evolution, of evolution unfolds as if according to the program originally laid down. Uh, achieving the state of integrality that can be considered as the main goal of the development of society. Therefore, integral futurology, in contrast to the future studies, puts forward not much, but only one scenario of the future the transformation of mankind to global integ integral society that means the interests of all mankind and preserves unity with all the richness of the diversity of nations. Uh, in concluding my report, I want to note that inter integral futurology is focused on not only on theory, but also on practice. I offer clear recommendations on how to construct an integral future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, I don't think we have too, uh, too much time for questions, but we can take one question. If someone has a question for the professor. Yes, Professor Fahim. Uh, well, I'll speak in Russian. <laughs> Valeria, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. I would like to ask you, well, the Russian futurology and such as Panov, Mazaritan and, and such, they write about singularity that will come by 40s and uh, demographic singularity, technological singularity and, and, and many others. How, what do you think in, in, in the frame of integral paradigm that you described? If 
if if there's a solution to all of that to all those problems thank you uh, yeah thank you very much for your question i assume that the idea of singularity is in essence once more of many scenarios that i already discussed uh, described before, like like scenario of catastrophe, global catastrophe. I assume that in the frame of a not only integral approach, but but also a just a description of the development of the system, like evolution, the global evolution. We talk about complexity and constant complexity of the level of those systems. So for with, to speak about singularity is, is the same as the new level of existence of our system, social system, global system, in which, which awaits us. I, I don't think we can jump over this level to, to singular to the level of singularity and all the system as far as i know in even in the natural systems those those things don't happen she means jump so one of the uh, possible scenarios thank you very much thank you thank you so much um we do have a question from youtube from Ulya Grekova, why did evolution give man the ability to realize himself, but did not give the mind to understand why we need it? Okay. Will you will you repeat uh, yes. the question once more, please? Yes. Why did evolution give man the ability to realize himself, but did not give the mind to understand why we need it. Um, uh, if possible, I answer in Russian, okay? Uh, it is thought that evolution and principle go related to the development of our uh, consciousness. Communi it's not only uh, for the for the people, mankind, but also for the global evolution itself. Why do we, why do we, uh, we're not conscious of, it, of this process? Because I think that that conscious process already is, is already in place. I don't think that the situation looks so pessimistic. I think we are conscious of that. And all the events that are happening right now, they, they, they force us to realize that. That's what I think. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor, uh, Dr. Uh, Kakaterian. Um, I would like to now present our next speaker. Um, Inger Levitas, she is um, our chair from the Department of Arts and Culture at Ivory. She holds a Bachelor in Fine Arts with a teaching degree in Visual Arts. She is from Narden, Holland, and she will speak about integral art for everyone. Inger? Yes, thank you very much, Alina. Well, indeed, I would like to present tonight a platform uh, for integral arts for all artists, um, all ages. Um, and to introduce that, uh, I would like to tell you more about the integral arts uh, and how we look at it from the arts department. So we see it as art is a means of educating people. And the goal of creating integral art is to deliver man to a happy existence in the world and to add an eternal and perfect existence on top of that. The new art will be completely different. It will be founded on the unity of people. Its role will be to tell us about a whole new range of sensations 
that will be revealed in the connection between us. Those will be sensations and relationships of a completely different scale. And from then on, these very sensations and relationships will be expressed through art and therefore also through our culture. The artist does this by feeling the others as himself. And in this cooperation creates a new experience. In him will appear completely new sensations and feelings and also ways to express them. The desire for aesthetics, for self-expression, is one of the basic desires of humanity. This will happen because the new art will implement a new desire. A person begins to demand a greater and higher fulfillment. And this perspective exists and will definitely happen. Basically, how we see it is that integral art is a vector of growth. So the Erie Arts and Culture Department launches today its online platform for artists, creatives and people with interest. It's for all ages. Where we unite the artists, create the new art and new culture for the future world. And to give you kind of a sneak peek, <laughs> I would like to show you this next video. So please check it out, Eerie Art at Facebook, and please join. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Inger. Thank you so much. Well, I would like now to present Dr. Kalechi Ahanonu Ajumole from Human Voice Offs, Biafra, West Africa. And Dr. Kalechi will speak about how did racism start and how could we cope with it? Dr. Kalechi? Thank you so much for the introduction. And uh, 
It's a great honor to see all of you one more time. This is our second conference. And please um, relax. Maybe I'm going to start this with a movie, a short movie, or it will be at the end of the movie. The topic is a little bit very uncomfortable when we talk about race and racism. But is the reality is uh, what is obtainable today. And we're going to find out scientifically if actually there was anything like race. If there was nothing like race scientifically, when was it invented? And who invented it? And for what purpose? I'm gonna share my screen and uh, we'll discuss that right away. Everyone can see my screen, hopefully. Good. Um, this is not necessary. All of you know who I am. So what is race and where did the idea of uh, being white or black person come from? Since science has already clearly showed everybody that we are made of the same particles. And our DNA is the same. We have uh, more like um, differences within races that we have in different races, if you know what I'm trying to say. All of us are genetically the same. And uh, some of us, all of us originally come from Africa and uh, some of us migrated out of Africa into colder and darker places. And in that process, thousands of years, they begin to lose their melanin. Melanin is what makes you black or lack of melanin makes you white. I think all of us know this. And then um, we, if you take a very good look at yourself right now, look at your hand, you will see that if you are so-called black person, you don't see anything called black, you see brown. And if you're so-called white person, you also see brown, but light one, the light brown. So uh, originally, all of us came from Africa, like I said, West Africans had this greater content of melanin and as it goes we have the east asians and then the northern europeans they're also our brothers and sisters by lighter skin so the question now is when did racism start i had to do a little inquiry and i went to the university of boston to talk to dr ibram kendi and dr ibram is uh He's a professor and uh, an activist. And actually he was um, nominated as one of the most um, prominent or important people by Time Magazine for 2020. And um, in his research, he was able to put a name on this guy who invented racism. And he called him Gomez de Surari. He's the chief chronicle of uh, Portugal who wrote a book in 1450 in which he did something that no one had ever done before. They needed a reason to go into Africa to kidnap people and they wanted to justify this. So he was given the permission to write this uh, book or to give justification for slavery and he wrote a book, and in his book, he put together all the people of Africa, a very diverse and uh, highly advanced people, and he put them into uh, a group of inferior, beastly, pagan, uneducated, that needed to be 
civilized. And everyone knows, and I think I think he was also very sure of what, uh, sure that when he was writing down that it was a lie. Because all pre-colonial time, some of the most sophisticated cultures in the world were found in Africa and are still in Africa. So why would this right to make this claim? I explained to you earlier, although the intention was to stratify the Portuguese uh, empire and also to satisfy the religious uh, conscience, maybe they were feeling bad. Why are we going to Africa to kidnap people and take them into slavery? So they had to create a fiction and write, like, you know, these people needed our help. And um, if we go back to pre-colonial time in Africa, as you can see the screen here, Africa has built, um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to uh, exaggerate. Um, most of the philosophical, scientific, architectural um, inventions uh, originally came from Africa. The screen I'm sharing with you is a uh, Benin wall. It was uh, found in Benin, which is in Biafra, um, Igodo and there. It's longer than the Chinese war and even stronger for defense. There are many others. We all know about the pyramids. Um, if you go to some parts of North Africa, you will see the pyramid of Giza and the pharaohs that built them and research uh, done on their skin and their hair proved that we are black people. So why would governments go so far as putting all the whole people of African descent into uncivilized. So from that level, he was able to create whiteness out of blackness. And um, the whole thing started going on. People started to believe that there are some superiority or inferiority race, which is purely unscientific. And we have explained that he went there to get free labor and to support his fiction and also to steal diamonds and gold for the colonial masters. But today we can also see more inventions coming out of Africa. Um, when I tell my students about Philip Emanuele, like he was the man who started the internet and supercomputers they immediately go online to check it because they don't really believe uh, it's possible that these things can come out of Biafra. Cyber optics, touchstone telephone, just to name a few. And uh, what is the solution? I've talked about the origin of race. How did this, uh, no, we know how it came about, but how are we going to get over it? How are we going to solve or cope? with racism, then it's going to give us, um, I want us to have a, a simple analysis that there's nothing wrong and there's nothing really good. It's all about perspective. And there is either oneness or separateness, but we are the same. There's one thing that quantum physics has made us to understand. I'm sure Professor, Professor, Professor Ephraim can attest to that that the observer and the observed are one and the same according to the laws of nature. Actually, it is the observer of the experiment that may determine the outcome of the experiment. So everything is inside the mind and our perceived consciousness. You may be wondering how is it related to race? It is because uh, we have seen that genetically we are the same. Even the color is not true that somebody is black or white because you can look at your skin and still prove to yourself that it's not like black or white scientifically. But to create a harmonious society, we need to understand the disharmony in the society and then tolerate and even cherish the differences. 
And um, environment determines everything. That's why in Ivory, we are developing a good environment where everybody with different opinions, worldview, can come together and we can share from um, our differences. We can develop and even get better and tolerate one another. Um, this is the wisdom from um, our ancestors. When I mean, when I say ancestors, I mean all of us, black, so-called black, so-called white, so-called Asians, we have one common ancestor, which is the scientific Adam. And with the wisdom of connection, we can learn this through integral education that the whole world is one and actually there shouldn't be black or white or yellow or any other name we can give it and um, when we look at the news today we will see that there's a huge division among people calling themselves different names and nationalities and um, it's like a ticking bomb if we do not do something about it, we may get into violence. And like history has shown us when people start to separate things based on colors and nationality, it could lead into concentration camps and killing of innocent people just because of a fiction that someone is different or somebody is more intelligent or less intelligent than another. I don't know how much time I have, but I'm going to quote some as uh, one of my best uh, astrophysicists. He said, one of the biggest problems with the world today is that we have large groups of people who, has, who will accept whatever they hear on the grapevine just because it suits their worldview, not because it's actually true or because they have evidence to support it. The really striking things is that it will not take much effort to establish validity in most of these cases, but people prefer reassurance to research. Reassurance that, for example, some men really think that they are more than women. Well, every science and everything has been proven that men, if there should be any one bigger or more intelligent, is not the man scientifically, it should be the woman because we may have bigger brain connections. But when people do not want to do a little bit of research, they fall back to this old belief that somebody is better or less than another. So my solution or the solution we're offering is an integral society where everybody will come together and um, learn how to tolerate and share with one another. I'm not going to quote Einstein because of time. You know, I have a video I want to share with you created by Ivory. That will be very uh, interesting to share with you. So together, we will make it. Thank you for your attention, but don't run away yet. I have to share a video with you. If you have any questions, please feel free to Ask me now as I'm going to find the video. Thank you, Dr. Kalechi. We do have a question. Um, why do we not feel that we are slaves to our desires? Why do we not feel that we are slaves to our desires? is very, very difficult. Uh, I must be honest. I do not have the answer for that right now. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else uh, like to pose a question? Oh. Okay, we have about four more minutes, um, Dr. Kalachi. I want to give you a final conclusion with a short video clip. Just give me a second to find it. I'm not very good at using computers. 
No problem. Thank you. Is there another question? Да, вопрос, почему мы должны быть, что значит, что значит быть едиными? Что значит быть одним? I'm so sorry. Can you repeat the question? Что значит быть единым? To be one unity, in unity. What does it mean to be free in one unity? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, there is a sense of joy that comes from having a deeper understanding of who you are. And though you have this power to do what you want to do, regardless of uh, whatever people may have a conception or uh, judgment about you. So freedom will be to fully live life to the fullest. And how can you live life to the fullest if you're always looking at who hates you and who loves you and who is black and who is white? You will be put in a box of um, complexes and on unhappiness. So, in my opinion, one needs to really connect with other people, find out that 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 you fear those things that you fear. Um, maybe uh, one of the great things in nature, like differences, make you happier. In my opinion, uh, things are supposed to be not only in black and white, but the unity and tolerance of every human being on the planet, including animals and even the weather. Without you can be able to operate on a, on a, on a, on a consciousness of abundance and peace. Uh, that's where I understand unity. It means everything comes and everything is good, black, white, and whatever. Even cultures and languages shouldn't be a problem for, for us. I'm not able to find this video. Unfortunately, it was done beautifully by Jasmine, but my system doesn't want to show it. I will share it on YouTube and our website, and you can have a look at it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelechi. If you do find it later, we should have time for that. So our next speaker um, is Professor Valentina Ilgana. I'm sorry, I'll try to pronounce this as well as I can. Ilganaiva. Uh, she has a doctorate of science and she is from the Ukraine. And she will speak today on the interaction as a factor of social and human integration. Thank you, Professor. Da, dobry vecher, всем. Good day, everybody. I greet everybody who is uh, involved in the conference. Uh, this is uh, the subject of my presentation. And uh, the material of my presentation shows some conclusions of the research conducted by the Every Humanities Department during the current year. Before starting the presentation, it is necessary to make a few preliminary comments on the object of consideration. First, recognition of the unity of universal laws of the development of the universe and co-evolutionary dependencies of the de development of systems of different nature, including society and humanity. Second, interaction is considered as a medial factor in the formation, development, and integration of systems. Interaction can also be considered as a system. Humanity is also a system that, that unites a representative of a single human race, but it is a complex diversity. Mm -hmm. 
In this presentation, I would like to justify the need to use constructive and conceptual synthesis as a method that allows you to operate with megasystem objects such as nature, science, and humanity. It is assumed that the universal principle of interaction can be fully applied in the projection to provide solutions to the problem of survival of the systems, social system, society and biosocial system, and humanity. The initial provisions regarding the recognition of the unity of the universal laws in the development of the universe and the existence of mutual dependencies of the development of system of different nature, including society, humanity, received a solid evidence base. Uh, also, uh, in areas of combining scientific and non-scientific knowledge, spiritual principles of East and West. In the beginning of the 20th century, uh, it was the understanding corresponds to the existing definition of interaction as an ob objective and universal form of development which determines the existence and structure organization of any material system. The interaction occurs at the level of aggregation of systems of different nature and manifests itself through a mechanism of conditions, connections between elementary principles interaction mechanism or a factor and, con and condition of system integration. This level of development corresponds to the stages of formation of system, inanimate, plant, animal, human, and spiritual. At the present, science has accumulated many examples of interaction that describe various physical, chemicals, wave field information, and other processes involving elementary particles, forces, inanimate living, and social systems. The determining factor in the formation of direction process in the connections and relations of those elementary formations of matter and substance that determine its nature and qualitative characteristics. The specific of information and media exchange within the between the systems. <laughs> it is an established scientific fact that the uh, interaction to for the interaction to occur, it is sufficient to have two multi-directional forces of elementary particles of matter which are manifested at the beginning of the development of systems and the processes of the origin and development of the universe. The application of universal law to the consideration <coughs> inside the system and between the systems. Um, interaction manifests itself concerning the actions of people to each other within the system of humanity. This understanding of the problem is a very well-established opinion of sociology, psychology, social psychology, and communication theory. I will add that um, the study of this formation of, of society, of socially allowed scientists to speak about the achievement of the integrative stage of development of society. Sociality manifests itself not only as a complementary property of natural individuals, but also as a result of human evolution in the artificial environment. 
Moreover, the modern global society is currently acquiring the future of single subject of social action and determines the nature of the functioning of the entire human civilization. The global society also becomes a single social institution that is subject to global unification and standardization, the establishment of common rules and norms of social life, common behavior, stereotypes, etc. Integration processes in society have affected all aspects of society, including the person as its bearer. This allows us to continue the systematic and integrative study of humanity, the main active elements in which a rep representative of a single human race. And, and, and also philosophy. This uh, traditional approach focuses on the differences in the global community, which is a complex diverse, diversity. The achievement of a modern critical state of mankind is a consequence and result of cultural and historical development in the vector of consumer of consumer attitude to nature and other representative of human race. Uh, each individual as a, a biological representative of the kind individual personality is a reflection of the level of development of society. However, we must take into account the principles of inter-system information exchange and feedback, which imply a return impact of the state of humanity on society. In other words, the problem of the state of the society cannot be considered based only on partial analysis, comparison, and criticism of the different states and behavior of subjects of social action in the individual group of institutional form. According to uh, the uh, <coughs> According to George Moore's uh, remark, there is only one race after all, humanity. Fragmentation of research of various racial, ethnational, religious, state status, political, and other parameters no longer correspond to stable trends toward achieving unity of humanity. We should not ignore the fact of integration of uh, the social system in its material, geographical, financial, economic, and other aspects. There's a sign of increased interaction in a system external to humanity, even if it is deprived, de derived from the combined activities of representative of the human race. It is confirmed that the research in the field of integral philosophy, communication engineering, and allows us to achieve the necessity, necessary level of coherence of social activities at all levels of the organizational society. We should admit that integration in society has become a, a catalyst for integration uh, processes in non-material areas that have affected politics, art, education, and trade. It revealed the symptoms of an emerging global evolutionary conflict in the world of individuals who want to achieve their environmental comfort. Researchers who are directing, detecting the processes of uh, atomization of society and man notice this. According to the researchers, society is divided into many points in spatial units and that and causes to be an anthropic universe, loses its spatiality. Um, 
expresses in the compatibility of being. This situation multiplies depending on the expansion and strengthening of network contains and is reproduced in the process of interaction of the uh, in the network environment of modern media space. This leads to a gradual pol polarization of opinions of the edge of good and evil as determining cultural oppositions, the ultimate states of social consciousness. These are concerned that violation of public connections and relationships, established traditions and norms lead to problems of violation of the quality of society itself, which represents a certain desired result of human life. According to British philosopher and sociologist Zygmunt Bauman, the violation of connections and relationships between people can be considered as the most serious disease of the society and its by by a social essence. Where's the way out? The solution is an, in use of human potential to overcome the consu consumer vector in relation to each other, nature and society. According to scientists, in the end, it is not social institutions, structures of systems, but communication that and the determining conduction condition of the development of society. This fear of interaction has become a system. This system manifests its existence inside and outside of society in all the variety of its system goals, methods, objects, and technologies. Objects that ensure the maintenance of homeostasis of itself and are included in the, in the inter-system processes. In other words, an, a person is being objectified as an idea or force which can be lead to qualitative change in the social connections and relationships. Thus, social interaction is a process and the result of human unification when it leads to the integ integral state of the action involved groups of communities of humanity as a natural systems interaction in the social system should be seen as a factor of integration and, con and con condition for reaching a new level of social organization. The circle of the independence of the system of humanity, society and nature is closing. The integrality of the world is revealed as a potentially necessary level of development of society and mankind in the common space, space of the universe. This is why the entire world scientific community and society as a whole must understand and accept the already established single scientific picture of the world, a single living space, a single human culture, cultural civilization, and the need to create a balanced dynamic interaction within the human system. This led us to polarization of opinions of evil and uh, good and evil. I need to add one more moment to what I said before that we need to add that the, the consciousness itself in, in its historical aspect 
go through evolution as the whole historical evolution. Sigmund Baum uh, said that this is the most serious disease of the society and there is no without the society of its biosocial essence. Для преодоления потребительского вектора в отношении друг друга, природы и общества. So according to scientists in the end, it, it is not social institution structures of systems, but the communication that is the determining condition for the development of the society. The sphere of interaction has be, became a system on its own. This system manifests its existence inside and outside of the society in all its variety and system goals, methods, objects, and technologies. It ensures maintenance of homeostasis of itself and are included in the inter-system processes. In our world, person is being objectified. The force could, could lead to a big change in the social connection and relationship. So uh, social interaction, it's, it's a process and a result of human unification and leads to leads to integral state of the parties involved. So as a natural system, interaction of the social system should be seen as a factor of integration and condition for reaching a new level of social organization. So, the integrality of the world is revealed as a potentially necessary level of development of society and mankind in the common space of the universe. This is why the entire world, scientific community and society as a whole must understand that and accept the already established single scientific picture of the world, a single living space a single human cultural civilization and the need to create a balanced dynamic interaction within the human system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valentina, for this wonderful presentation. Um, we have a quite a tight discussion, but we do have uh, time for a question. So please uh, answer your question. Yes, please go ahead. Valentina, thank you so much for the beautiful, beautiful presentation to very depth analysis of your topic. The question that I have is such. You speak about the role of interaction. Do, do, do you separate any kind of interaction because not all the interaction lead to integration, uh, especially uh, as far as uh, social interaction are concerned, of course. The interaction also um, uh, manifests itself in different forms. We distinguish between a few levels of uh, uh, social interactions. The main of it and, and foremost is the connection connection uh, biological kind between the uh, people and in our society and uh, and after, and then we look at the contact and besides that form it's it's a separate subject but we, we have a lot of publication on it and that was that was prepared by our department and the fourth furthermore we look at the uh, social interaction this is the, the most ancient 
and uh, long lasting it, it, the, the interaction in society that has its own form the dial dialogue uh, and, and and all kind of dialogues and now we're talking about communi communicative communicative uh, interactions all of them have their own social uh, purpose especially the uh, uh, in the beginning contacts <coughs> that have uh, uh, gave uh, birth to uh, all kind of interactions so uh, the, that interaction is the basis of all, all kind of interaction it's it's kind of like a embryo that has all kind of forms in it on evolutionary processes and so of course yeah they're all different but they all uh, developed in in, the, in, the, in with with a certain intention there is always uh, intention to exploit the other so i i i, I personally call it in negative into conversion <clears throat> so everything is dedicated to um, the, the the goal of individual so we talk about communication in the, in the contemporary <clears throat> society becomes a turning point this is uh, we're talking about uh, the per perception of reality and uh, about uh, understanding of of the uh, the reality and this is the uh, the direction that uh, being looked at and developed and but all those technicalities is a uh, private details of that direction Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. Um, I would like to say for everyone that's um, being part of this through YouTube and Facebook, we receive a lot of questions and we will collect all the questions. And if we have time at the end of this conference, we will uh, answer the questions um, or during the round table discussion, which is tomorrow, or they can be taken to the Facebook group, which is called Erie Global. And I would like to mention our uh, email address for any other questions, which is projecterie at gmail.com. So thank you very much. We go to the next presenter uh, of today, which is um, Gregory Notkin. He's from our Erie uh, Research Associate. He's from U Ukraine, and he will be speaking about Reality Tunnel from Diversity to Unity. So please go ahead. Mr. Grigory Notkin, you may give your presentation if you're ready, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for presenting me. I'd like to say that this is so wonderful to listen to all the preceding presenters. And we're talking about the unity of the world and the unity of the mankind and uh, its harmonization in my presentation is also uh, dedicated to that and not much different from other presentation uh, this is a tunnel of reality from diversity to unity let me open my presentation and a second please <coughs> Uh, can you see uh, my shared screen? Okay. Uh, so tunnel of reality from diversity to unity. 
this is a like kind of annotation. Uh, the report is a tunnel of reality. Uh, it's devoted to actual problem changing on the worldview of the modern generation of people. The problem of forming a new consciousness of the mankind's unity of all the diversity of people, cultures inhabiting on our earth. At the end of my presentation, I will open the conclusion of my presentation. So maybe that would be um, a little bit more convenient to do that. So the modern humanity has a special task to learn how to create the strength and good good relations with all that today's diversity of people movements political parties significant differences in the way of life of the secular and religious population great differences in cultural religious traditions in other words to learn to perceive to feel the unity of the world which consists of many people, con countries, with all the great differences. After all, the survival of earthly civilization with so many weapons of mass destruction, global imbalance with the natural environment, depends on the radical, radical change in the outlook of most people living in our planet. From today's thinking, dividing all reality into me and them, we and others, ours and strangers, friends and enemies, to the general planetary consciousness, consciousness of the unity of all mankind as a single system, in the feeling that we're all one family. We'll, we'll talk about the, uh, the natural environment right now. Uh, biodiversity is the most important factor in the development of life on Earth. If you look closely at how life was formed in our, on our planet, how it continues to exist despite of all the threats of its existence, then the most important factor for stable development is a huge variety of natural and biological links. Biodiversity is one of the fundamental phenomena that characterizes the manifestation of life on Earth. The decline in the level of biodiversity takes a special place among the main, main environmental problems of our time. Uh, the article of Single, 2017. The most important reason in, in the desire to conserve biodiversity is that it plays a leading role in the ensuring the stability of ecosystems and biosphere as a whole absorption of pollution, stabilization of the climate, provision of habitable conditions. The ecological value of species diversity is a prerequisite for the survival and sustainable functioning of ecosystems. Biological species, species provide the processes of formation, soil fertility. And this is the, uh, the taking from, from the book, the, uh, the ecological. Also, the human body consists of millions of cells, dozens of organs, which are anatomically, psychologically different from one another, physiologically different from one another. But the correct interaction, maintaining the balance of receiving and giving in each cell organ ensures the integrity and health of the organism. That is the most important factor for harmonious development. The integrity of any link in the natural environment, including our body, is the diversity of its individual parts links. But provided that they complement each other, a balance of in interchange is maintained between them. Uh, awareness of the importance of different differences between people. Human society emerged, developed according to the same laws of the functioning of the natural environment of which it is a part. Primitive tribes different little, di uh, differ little from those animal communities among which they live. They struggle for survival, for the pr pres preservation of a kind 
a tribe lead to a first struggle with the neighboring tribes, the animal world. The unification of different small tribes increased the chance of survival, increased the resistance of such communities to various kind of cataclysm, natural phenomenon, uh, the, the further development of human society from a primitive communal to slave system and the uh, feudalism, capitalism, and socialism contributed to the creation of kingdoms, empires, modern countries with an era, ever increasing variety of the subjects, citizens, property, educational, and mental differences between people in one country, a group of countries were constantly growing. In recent centuries, a large part of the population has achieved a period adhering to a secular lifestyle, uh, an aesthetic uh, perception of the world. And all these differences between people, nation, countries, on, all the, on one hand, led to, <clears throat> to personal and social conflicts, quarrels, bloody wars. But on the other hand, they are the most important factors of the development of human civilization. They increase the chances of preserving life on our planet. True, on condition that we learn to use all these differences not for conflicts, wars, but for the sake of mutual enrichment of each other, for a more objective perception of the world around us. To today's tendencies toward globalization of the world, even closer interconnections, interdependence of even the most distant countries from each other, and the presence of weapons of mass destruction, in many of them prompts more and more scientists, public figures, representative economic and politi political and elites to pay special attention to the harmonization of relations between very different people nations that so far however it is not uh, very successful Vladimir Vernadsky wrote humanity is one and although the overwhelming mass of it is recognized but this unity is manifested by forms of life which actually deepen and strengthen is it in perceptibility for a person spontaneously as a result of unconscious aspiration to him the life of humanity humanity with all its heterogeneity has become invisible united <clears throat> I also would like to say about practical states of unity. Uh, development of a modern system of integral united people, a bringing and education provides general knowledge, practical skills, how good relations are created between yesterday's ideological and other opponents. It's from the book of uh, Ulyanov enlightenment. Of course, it takes a certain time for understanding, recognition to come that all the differences between individuals, movements, parties, not only do not interfere with the mutual understanding, but contribute to it. If you learn the art of mutual concessions, compromises. If we agree that no one is absolutely right, if you recognize the limitation of each because of his ego, object, ob objectivity, perceive the world around him. This is a very important thing to uh, recognize. And we need uh, all the diversity of the op opinions out there. Uh, there is also such a term in the modern session section of psychology, quantum psychology, reality tunnel. This reality tunnel can be explained when comprehending reality due to the mutual enrichment of different opinions. Uh, Timothy Leary, the first one who used that term, and Wilson, the author of, his, uh, of this work, states, uh, the diversity of people can be a huge evolutionary force for our human race. After all, we can le learn from individuals, futures, features which allow them to use, to see, hear, and feel things that we were previously trained not to see, hear, or not feel.
And uh, this is very important approach to uh, for understanding how to uh, interact between people. And also a few citation uh, about communication between people. Uh, I'll probably uh, put a slide on the screen because my presentation is coming to the end. Uh, so, here it is. I'm sorry for the little delay. It's about communication between the people. Uh, so we discuss in turn without interrupting one another at the time stipulated by the regulations all opinions are important as well as mine and this is a powerful mechanism that allows different people to hear and agree in some ways with the diverse even opposite opinions on certain issues it's round table discussion brainstorming according to the certain principles. This is the, from the book of uh, ontologists. Uh, Hertz draws attention to, we must learn at least to perceive what we cannot accept from the surrounding world. We must learn to, to at least perceive what we cannot accept. It is, it is extremely difficult to achieve this, as it always has been, and is the skill that we must uh, try tirelessly master, and those very interesting uh, words of Zachary Woods, uh, the, the, the famous the psychologist, who said, "We become stronger, not weaker, if we dare to make contact with those." with whom we disagree. We can develop the capacity for empathy and deeper understanding if we try to get acquainted with the conflicting ideas and unfamiliar opinions. So, and uh, also a uh, very important and powerful mechanism that allows different people to hear and agree in some ways. Uh, so this this could practically in practice help people to overcome uh, uh, this uh, seeming diversity and maybe to agree with one another with the uh, uh, maybe even opposite uh, opinions this uh, all brainstorming according to certain principles uh, five the basic principles. All opinions are important as well as mine. We discuss in turn without interrupting each other at the time stipulated by the regulations. We do not we do not express disagreement, negative judgments about previous opinions. We do not argue, but we add our own arguing it. We try to find a solution that satisfies everyone in several rounds of discussions of the problem or get closer to it. The most important principle of working out a common solution is the art of seeing mutual concessions compromises. So such discussions and roundtables according to the uh, indicated principles make it possible for a variety of people to find out the opinions of each other, to agree with them in some ways, to feel other people. Even yesterday's opponents are cl uh, as closer, beginning to arouse sympathy. It's a very important psychological principle. So when the arguing parties uh, try to understand and agree with one another, Another. So uh, that's, that's some kind of a warm relationship uh, uh, aroused between them. So now I, I come to my the conclusion. So I'd like to, uh, the first one, diversity in nature, biodiversity insurance, the sustainability of the development of the entire biosphere is, as, is essential for the survival of mankind. Diversity of people, nations, or on our, on our planet, no diversity, is the most important factor in the emergence of the harmonious civilization of reason in the near future. 
united humanity in no sphere by provided but provided that the majority of the inhabitants on earth understand that it is the diversity of cultures historical features of the development of each people country group of countries that is useful it is important for the formation of the planet planetary consciousness of unity. An example of building such a community is required in which people, different in many proper qualities, learn to overcome all differences, find the possibility of mutual concessions, compromises, begin to feel like a single system, a single family. And the, the, the practical steps towards creating a society in which everyone cares about each other, perceives everyone as a single family, despite the great differences between people, movements, parties, begin with the recognition of the usefulness of these differences. The differences that complement each other make it possible to more objectively perceive the surrounding reality, to make less mistakes in choosing the development strategy for each country and the whole world. And the most important element in the formation of such worldview leading to unity is the rapidly developing system of, of integral upbringing and education, a powerful mechanism that contributes to the reconciliation of different, even op opposite, opposing opinions in the discussion of all pressing problems in the format of round table on certain principles leading to search of mutual compromises and common agreement. And with that, I'd like to conclude my presentation. Thank you so much for your attention and time. And if we have time for questions, please, I'm open to it. Thank you very much, Grigory. Uh, this was really a wonderful presentation. Uh, we do have question which came from Facebook and it's from Sergei Lubenko. And I would like to ask Zana, if you please, it's in Russian, can ask the question to Gregory. Or possibly Natalie, can you translate? Uh, sure, is that in the chat? Yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, hold on a second, let me open the chat. Here it is. Uh, is that from Pavel? Is that what it is? Oh, oh Lupitenka. Uh, elementary, elementary particles of the society, it's an adequate analogy um, of elementary. Oh, you want me to read in Russian? Is that what you want me to? Oh, both is fine. Okay. Um, elementary particles of the society, if it's an adequate analogy of elementary particles in, in physics. Uh, this is too abstract. Uh, we don't consider specific of physical and social systems is it, it's uh, very deep uh, differences and um, united scientific picture of the world. Um, it, you, you say that, but uh, there always be many of those pictures and they're often um, uh, op opposite to one another contradictory so this this kind of approach i think it's a, a utopia that's what it says in in, in a question or comment of, of sorry lupitenko thank you very much thank you very much for utopia um, um, this is a different uh, points of view. Maybe I didn't understand. It's, it's uh, in, indeed it's a complicated question. Uh, in reality, people have polarized opinions uh, on, on the same uh, subject. They could argue endlessly about it and could lead even to the conflict. But we live uh, in the 21st century after all, and we understand that uh, the, the general globalization and interdependence of the countries and people it, it reached its its uh, uh, the critical point, and whether we want it or not, we need to listen to one another and interact uh, peacefully. So, and the psychologists talk about it, and the 
Quantum psychology talks about it, that people start to understand that they cannot comprehend the reality, its complexity and its in all its glory. And so in, in their egoistic uh, perception, it's limited perception of reality and, and their education uh, again, does not allow them to see that. So it, we should allow opposite opinions. So if if uh, uh, both parties understand that they have only partial perception of the reality, then they could come to some kind of agreement, some kind of reconcil reconciliation, and form opinion that would illustrate uh, the picture of the reality a little bit more closer. And so you probably know about it, the bulk of uh, wisdom, um, some wisdom. So the statistically proven that uh, different opinions could be uh, described more realistic picture of the world than um, one single opinion, even if it's some of the, even the, the most um, uh, talented one. So diversity is bringing to more united uh, opinion. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll go to the next presenter of today, which is Ms. Karen Levine. Uh, she's from New York, USA, and uh, she's a member of our Erie Children's Education Department. Her presentation will be about Dewey, inspired education in the coronavirus era, perspectives from within a fun, socially oriented virtual school experiment. Well, go ahead. Um, yes, thank you, Inger, and thank you to all the speakers so far. I really enjoyed it, um, and I'll get right to it. Um, um, this paper that I submitted a few months ago to the conference is a sort of a, pre a preparatory paper to a longer work I'm developing over the next half year, um, where I've begun to examine uh, some of the innovative educational developments that took place in the ERE Institute. Um, in our department in childhood education. And um, I've begun this examination um, based on the philosophy of John Dewey. And uh, there are several reasons for that. Well, first of all, I really like John Dewey. I think uh, he's very close to integral methodology. Um, and also he is um, really the philosopher of education from the 20th century. Um, uh, he was one of the most influential uh, philosophers of education, uh, particularly in the United States, and he continues to be. Um, and just, um, I actually picked up his books uh, right before the coronavirus started when libraries were still open, uh, which is not the case anymore. Um, so I could just show you, he was a very prolific writer. So this is the, the books uh, on which this, um, work is based on, I think I'll have about five minutes to uh, to summarize the main points I took from those in this work. Um, and then I will try to show how, you know, the his philosophy and particularly his metaphysics um, can be maybe extended or interpreted through this new experimentation of um, children's education in, uh, in virtual re uh, reality. Um, and uh, okay, let me start my presentation. Um, okay. Um, just a second. Okay, present. Oops. Present. Okay, so I hope everyone can see that. Um, so I'm just going to start with a quote um, from School and Society, uh, which he wrote in 1900. Um, the obvious fact is that our social life has undergone a thorough and radical change. If our education is to have any meaning for life, it must pass through an equally complete transformation. Now, he wrote this over a century ago, referring to the great social changes that were happening with um, the Industrial Revolution. Um, and I think uh, now, um, I think Dewey's philosophy is very universal and the same kind of words could be applied today. Uh, there's great social changes happening now, particularly in this time of coronavirus. Um, 
really many changes going on, especially in society and education. So here um, he's uh, kind of um, saying that when there are such uh, great social changes uh, that the education must completely transform, you know, if it is to, ha to have any meaning for life. So, um, oh wait, how do I? Okay, there we go. So the title of this paper, um, which I was working on a few months ago, is Dewey Inspired Education in the Coronavirus Era, Perspectives from Within a Fun, Socially Oriented Virtual School Experiment. And if we have time, um, I'll get into sort of the next uh, stage that kind of following Dewey, um, um, that I've been going to do some work with Schopenhauer, which I think uh, extends the thinking started here. So the kind of working title now is um, Mapping Social Virtual Education on Dewey's and Schopenhauer's Metaphysics. Um, I don't know if we'll have time to get into Schopenhauer. If the moderator could please give me like a five minute um, uh, you know, notice. Um, so I'll know uh, how far to, to go into this. Um, so I'll just talk briefly uh, about Dewey's metaphysics and views on education. Then I'll, um, I'll get a little bit into this um, virtual school experiment that was developed and implemented in Erie. And since then also continued by um, some partners and colleagues of Erie and um, then try to make some connections with uh, how this experiment is illum illuminated by Dewey's philosophy. And in doing that, I would like to um, point out one of Dewey's very interesting um, concepts. He talks about empirical philosophy when um, you know, we take some practical um, experiences or testing and then we perform a philosophic work with it that this work of philosophy um, results in a unique product that can then be reinserted into the practical um, experience and extend the realization of potentialities. So I hope um, some of that can be accomplished um, uh, with this uh, philosophical work. Um, and then if we have time, um, I'll talk a little bit about further questions for consideration um, regarding um, whether virtual education entails a loss because we minimize embodied experiences or embodied knowledge, or um, stated differently, do we advance or regress epistemologically and experientially speaking when we disregard the physical bodies and crude physical experiences? And uh, those questions are explored further with Schopenhauer's metaphysics. Um, so my tentative hypothesis, I'm just gonna th throw this out, um, kind of my tentative hypothesis in this work at this stage is that disembodied um, socially oriented education in the virtual reality can be a means of coming to know ourselves and reality in senses beyond knowledge or reason. And the children of today are naturally inclined to develop into this dimension. And I hope I'll be able to show how um, I'm getting to this hypothesis. Okay, so um, now, um, let me briefly go over Dewey's metaphysics and views on education. Um, so um, in his book, um, Experience and Nature, as well as other works, um, he really um, outlines this idea that um, conscious experience or really all human experience is in and of nature. Um, and let me um, talk a little bit about that. So. Um, the human condition um, is such that the individual consciousness is always undergoing uh, this experience that is in and of nature. And uh, he really writes about this um, beautifully. Um, he, well, he writes that experience possesses depth and breadth to an indefinitely elastic extent and that it penetrates into nature and expands without limit through it. Um, he writes that human experience is the only method for penetrating nature's secrets um, and that this applies to materialistic experiences, just to aesthetic and moral ones. So, um, you know, the aesthetic and moral and sort of um, more disembodied uh, experiences reach as deeply and truly into nature as engagement in materialistic or physical sciences. Um, and also the, the consciousness that experiences nature being in and of nature 
it cannot be a distinct or, or separate entity from nature because then such experience would be impossible. So the consciousness is embedded into nature and undergoes a process of continuous discovery as it expands um, throughout nature. Now, all of these ideas are laid out in his work, experience and nature. Um, and then furthermore, he makes a really interesting statement throughout many of his works. Um, he says, all experience is social. Um, so I think that's really interesting, an interesting statement in light of the fact that all experience is in and of nature, um, that it's also social. He says, all experience is social. And um, he's very prolific about you know, education and what education should be like. So I think these educational views are informed by his metaphysics. He, um, he uh, uh, underlines uh, in many of his works that social and moral, and moral learning uh, should be the main focus of education. Um, he's kind of critical of um, you know, uh, prior education systems and their focus on technical knowledge and really um, constantly underlines the need for, uh, for social uh, learning experiences, um, the need to learn through a social environment. Um, and um, I can just show another quote um, from uh, the book, Democracy in Education. The previous, um, the previous quote was from Moral Principles in Education and um, in Democracy in Education, which is a really uh, a, a major work of his. He writes, um, all the aims and values which are desirable in education are moral, where moral traits are marks of a person who is a worthy member of society so that what he gets from living with others balances with what he contributes. So again, he says all the aims and values in education should have, should be moral and social um, relating to, you know, this giving and receiving of society um, between an individual and society. Um, and then I just wanna point out another, um, another theme uh, which he talks about, which is our constraints in interpreting these notions um, and being able to know um, their authentic um, referential values. Um, so, um, um, okay, let me, I'm still here. Um, he says that we are constrained um, by limitations or prejudices um, when we, um, you know, uh, talk about these concepts such as nature, experience, social, moral, um, we're constrained and limited by the education we have received from society so far. So, you know, when we think about the referential values of these words, meaning, you know, when we use these words, what do they refer to? What is kind of the meaning behind these words? Um, we interpret them, you know, based on the education we received from uh, society. Um, and um, he says we could, uh, we could come closer to uncovering their authentic uh, referential values, or um, we, can, we can surpass, uh, surpass the prior referential values of these notions because we have a capacity um, to delve further and deeper uh, by using reflective and creative philosophical inquiry. Um, so again, inviting us to kind of uh, stretch the limits of uh, how we understand these, um, these notions, um, you know, of, of what is society, what is nature, what is experience. Um, okay, so at this point, I wanna uh, shift to um, looking at the educational experiment that took place in Erie and then um, go on to thinking how that um, correlates to Dewey's philosophy. Um, I'm gonna show just for half a minute uh, a video kind of summarizing the educational experiment so that uh, hopefully to kind of get into that. Um, that um, I hope you'll have sound, okay. Hi, Hi Vicky. Hello, how are you? Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Arthur 8 a.m. The first lesson begins in the virtual school. Good morning. We have now a history lesson and we will visit a medieval city. Let's go. 60 students from all over Israel from first to sixth grade take part in the pilot project 
each from the home, on their computer. They are all together as avatars in the virtual school. For several hours a day, core subjects such as English, math and history are taught in different 3D worlds. Okay, um, so just uh, that was just to, to give like a visual um, of, uh, of what this experiment looked like. Um, and so, um, as we could see, it took place in this virtual reality. Um, you know, the children and the teachers arrived in, in their virtual classrooms. Um, their physical bodies were sitting in their rooms, you know, separated by large physical distances. Some of these people were even located half the globe apart from each other. Um, and they interacted through their avatars in the classroom. Then uh, they went outside of the classroom to a campus, to a forest. Um, and this all took place in this realistic uh, kind of realistic setting in Verbella. Later, they took some of these activities to a more game-like virtual world in Minecraft. Um, uh, Afterwards, they also explored um, other virtual platforms such as Eureka, uh, which offered sort of other type of, uh, types of experiences. For example, what we saw learning about medieval times by walking around this uh, me medieval street and castle in this virtual world, uh, or um, they had a lesson about marine life, and then they swam underwater in this virtual world, observing you know, jellyfish and other animals that they were learning about. Now, in the course of these um, experiences, the, the participants, the children and the teachers um, engaged in a shared real life experience. So um, although everything was virtual, including the avatars through which they experienced these activities together, um, instead of through physical bodies, uh, they really had uh, real social experiences. And these were experienced by real people or um, I guess their consciousness that was uh, present in this virtual world uh, rather than you know wherever they were physically located. Um, so just as an example, um, um, one of the children in this virtual world of Verbella, um, she wasn't able to get to her classroom when it was time for class. She got lost in this virtual campus and she became really scared and, and she felt really lost. And she asked you know, the adults not to leave her alone. Um, and at the same time, she really was safe in her, um, in her home, but she was more fully um, participating um, in the shared uh, virtual reality. Um, so, so her consciousness was inhabiting this shared, uh, very real space together with her friends and teachers. And um, after, after the experiment, when the children were asked, you know, what struck the most about this experience, um, what they enjoyed most, almost all of them responded that the best part was being together with their friends there. Um, so this experience of being together in this virtual world was quintessentially social. Um, and um, the, the physical dimension of experience was, uh, was muted and uh, pretty much all that was left um, in this virtual school was the social or uh, moral dimension supported by this virtual setting. So um, kind of getting a feel for this experience uh, and returning to Dewey uh, for a moment to try to map um, this experience onto his uh, metaphysics. Um, um, I want to uh, cite another quote for, from his book, Democracy in Education. Um, and this quote is kind of the culminating, um, like on the last few pages of the book after he um, talks a lot about, um, in that particular book about, you know, the meaning of democracy and social, um, the social order that he thinks um, is, 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 is ideal. Um, so this book kind of culminates in this statement, which, um, I really, I, I really like this, uh, this quote. Um, so he goes, uh, what one gets and gives as a human being, a being with desires, emotions, and ideas is not external possessions, but a widening and deepening of conscious life, a more intense, disciplined, and expanding realization of meanings. What he materially receives and gives 
is at most opportunities and means for the evolution of conscious life. Um, so um, I would love to hear maybe um, other thoughts and kind of responses to this, um, but the, the outcome that sort of I was, um, I was getting from mapping um, this virtual setting um, and kind of delving into Dewey is that the virtual setting provides a means to engage in real interactions while annulling the physical or material experience. And again, referring back to this quote, he says the, the, the material or physical experience is at most opportunities and means for the evolution of conscious life um, and realization of meaning. So, um, so I think this virtual setting um, frees um, us to engage more fully in the inter internal realm of meaning and um, expanding consciousness. Now, I don't know if we have time to talk a little bit about um, how this uh, line of thinking is expanded um, through Schopenhauer. I don't know if I have time to, um, to continue. Um, okay. Um, so um, the, the question that sort of arises uh, out of this is, does virtual education entail a loss when we minimize these embodied experiences or embodied knowledge? And this is, I think, the prevalent view today by many teachers, many parents, you know, who see the shift to virtual education as a, as a loss, you know, as something uh, a regression and uh, that by not engaging in, uh, in, in physical experiences that the, the, the children are losing something. Um, and uh, also from the philosophical kind of point of view, we can ask, are we advancing or regressing epistemologically, meaning um, in our knowledge um, or kind of ability to know um, things? and experientially in the experiences we're having, when we disregard physical bodies and crude physical experiences. Um, and so in, in exploring this question, which kind of arose after, um, after thinking about Dewey, I turned to Schopenhauer um, and how that might inform us about that question. And again, the moderator, please uh, stop me if I'm, if I'm uh, out of time, um, because this is kind of, part two um, of this inquiry. So um, Arthur Schopenhauer was a German philosopher and um, he has this really um, uh, famous book called The World as Will and Representation or Idea. So this was a translation from German and um, some translators um, translate this as representation and some translate it as idea. So those are kind of the same concept as translated to English, where he, um, uh, he's really influenced by Kant um, and Kantian philosophy and um, where he's, he says um, the, the main um, kind of uh, thing in existence is this, what he calls will, and it's something Kant calls the thing in itself. And then everything else are representations or ideas of that will. Um, so this is based on Kant's transcendental idealism, uh, which teaches us that all phenomenon, you know, all things in the world, they're representations only and not things by themselves. Um, so Kant calls this the thing in itself, Schopenhauer calls this the will. And um, Kant says this thing in itself is underlying all phenomena and the whole of nature. Uh, and Schopenhauer calls this the will, which is the only real true primary metaphysical thing in the world and everything else are phenomena uh, which are representations or idea. And he also um, says that will lies beyond knowledge or reason uh, that it's metaphysical while knowledge is physical um, and depends on faculties of the physical body. Um, and he also says that will is, uh, is unknowable yet, um, yet he does urge us to um, inquire into um, into uh, discovering what this will is, which I think implies that he's saying that it is knowable, but in a form that's beyond um, knowledge or reason. And so again, I'm, um, uh, I mentioned this in the beginning of my presentation, my tentative hypothesis uh, right now is that from 
looking at the virtual education is that disembodied um, and socially oriented education in the virtual reality can be a means of coming to know ourselves and reality in senses beyond knowledge or reason and that children of today are naturally inclined to develop in this dimension, into this dimension. Um, and I think also importantly, um, this, um, this metaphysics that the world is my idea, like uh, right, ideas sort of projected by the will, it doesn't deny the physical reality, but um, it, it just informs us that the, the, the material reality does not exist irrespective of the perceiver. So the two are compatible, empirical reality, right, as studied by the physical sciences and transcendental real, uh, ideality, they are compatible. And um, uh, Schopenhauer talks about this concept of uh, the world being a, uh, only a dream. He refers to Plato that talked about this, uh, the, the Vedas and Puranas, kind of Indian philosophy. We know also Jewish um, uh, sources say the same thing. Um, and so, um, so this sort of uh, physical reality um, is construed sort of as a dream, as almost not having an existence in itself, but that there is an inner nature of the world um, that is distinct from the idea. And um, he's urging us to explore, you know, whether the world is something else, it's more than an idea or more than this um, phenomenological dream. Um, and he talks about the role of the physical body in all of this, which is um, our topic of um, inquiry at the moment, um, sort of what happens, right, when we start to perceive, um, when we minimize the role of the physical body. Um, so he, Schopenhauer does say that the physical body is also an idea uh, generated by the will, but it has a unique uh, role, a, a unique place. It's an idea through which we, um, we perceive other ideas. So the physical faculties of the body um, determine how we perceive um, or generate these other ideas. Um, and he writes that uh, the body is nothing but objectified will, uh, will that becomes idea or the objectivity of will. Um, and um, I'm suggesting that in kind of moving to the virtual space, we de-objectify de um, the will and um, my kind of suggestion at this point is that um, when we um, inhabit this virtual world, we change our use of and relationship with the physical body, which leads us closer to knowing the will, which again, the will is sort of unknowable. It's beyond reason or knowledge. Um, and that might become possible if we annul um, the body completely. And I am suggesting that children today are um, inclined to this naturally as they are just drawn to these virtual worlds much more than the physical world. And again, um, that concludes my presentation. Um, again, this is all kind of preliminary thinking and I, I will kind of be working more on this over the next half a year. So if we have another conference, I hope I'll have um, kind of more definitive um, insights into this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, we do have uh, some questions, or at least one. Um, when, let's see, when developing a vir virtual study where, there, where their children will lose their communication skills in real life, they may start thinking like in a game and the level of knowledge that will be with such training. I think, I guess it's a reflection, really not a question per se, when developing a virtual study, whether children will lose, oh, I guess if the children will lose their communi communication skills in real life, if they start thinking, you know, it's a game, how would you address that? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I think that again reflects sort of the fear and hesitation of many parents and teachers to, um, you know, to spend so, so much time, um, you know, of, of children's education in the virtual reality. And I think the fact of this, uh, of what's happening now, it leaves us no choice. I mean, we are in this virtual reality. I mean, I know at least here in New York, the virus is just going up. I mean, um, but in terms of um, losing the social and communication skills, I think this is 
exactly why it's so crucial to focus on the social and communicative aspect of education, even virtually, um, that, uh, you know, education should, uh, should, I mean, while imparting, you know, technical knowledge um, in different fields, it has to um, really focus on the social aspect of education and communication. And I think uh, there's no problem that it's virtual because I think the virtual, whatever is learned virtually, in the social sphere does translate um, into the physical interactions as well. Uh, but it is very important to make, you know, a special emphasis on social interactions, interactions of communication. Um, and I think uh, the fact that it's a game, um, I mean, I think children are always in a game, you know, the minute you leave them alone and don't force them to do what you want, they're playing, they're imagining. And so I don't think that's, that's negative. Um, yeah, thank you. I hope that that answered. Thank you so much, Karen. I don't see any other questions right now, um, but we will hopefully have time at the end uh, of the session today to address other questions that we have not been able to get to. So our next speaker is Pastor Akim. Onyekachi Ikwunze. And the pastor is from South Africa. He's a theologian, biz businessman, and director at Rock Glen Zimbabwe Limited and CEO of Domainso Investment Group South Africa. He uh, is an electrical engineer with a postgraduate in entrepreneurship. His topic is marriage a critical aspect for family relationships in our world. Pastor? Good day, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the platform. It's been so informative and educative for you know, all of us. And I'm so glad to be part of this uh, work. Um, I'll speak on marriage a critical aspect of family relations in our world. The consciousness of uh, nature around us and who we are plays a great role in understanding the subject of our discussion and solving the challenges of quality that pertains to the present or the recent times, true synthesis in society science and culture. Society, science and culture um, cannot be dealt with in isolation. I will narrow down my discussion on culture, but before I do, I would like to shed light on the fundamental part of nature and creation. It goes back to the beginning of time. We believe in a force, a source, an originator, who created everything and pre-existed creation. He made science and arranged our society in an organized order. Hence, the totality of a person's way of life in relation to his environment and elements that surround him are his reality. I would like to point to the application of science as the most important tool in the whole of life itself. What is said to, what is said of the use of word for mankind is what separates them uh, from animals. Also, you cannot separate a man from his word. A man's word is his bond and his identity. Without the privilege of seeing my image, you can only imagine my personality or identity with regards to my voice which you can hear or perceive. It is agreed in most spiritual system that the Supreme Being who created all that is, used words to create and recreate, thereby producing animate and inanimate objects. An understanding that the concept of the word spoken, call it what you may, brought forth light over darkness, 
the elements that were created were already in existence. Hence, we make reference to Einstein's theory of relativity, where he says energy is equal to mass times speed of life squared, where energy, mass are equivalent and transmittable, 020202. Energy E, mass, that's M, matter, hence substance. And then C is constant, which is speed of light squared, which is 010101. What does that tell you? That energy is matter. Therefore, if energy is matter, it means your speech is matter. Hence, the smallest component of any element may not be an atom. It likely to be a sound mass, meaning in every particle, there is a sound wave that can contain a sound code. If it contains a sound code because it contains a sound wave, it means it will respond to a sound wave. This helps us to see the relationship between physical things and spiritual things. I mean, those that study quantum physics will relate to this. You can understand why we will call things from the spiritual realm into the physical. Our words are powerful. They are a bridge between the physical and spiritual. They are both physical and interestingly, they are spiritual. Think about this. It is true that speech creates sound wave and therefore has energy. For instance, when we tune the volume of your radio so much that it produces vibration when it's on bars or high pitched, it indicates the presence of sound wave. Then it is true that sound wave has energy. They come from speech. It is the power of speech. This is why high intensity ultrasound focusing is used to destroy cancer cells. It means that words can destroy cancer cells depending on their intensity. Therefore, the words we speak can create or destroy. This means that it is dangerous to speak negative words because you are instructing subatomic particles on what you are involved in. It is just like Mr. Masaru Emoto, a Japanese pseudoscientist, who became world famous because of his pioneering and original research on the effect of words or emotions on molecular structure of ordinary water. He claimed that expressions of positive or negative emotions affect water and then observed these true frozen crystals of water. Solving the problem, this is the reason we have to go back to a fundamental base to correct the omission of the spiritual path of education, which was systematically removed from the inception of modern education. The modern right thinking, the modern right thinking person has no doubt about the worth of education, which connects humans to the achievements of civilization and prepares them for the independent cre creative activity in their chosen field of endeavor. Both the family and the university play a vital and pivotal role in education because the educational process emerges from the family and the teaching process from the high educational institution. Education, which is now primarily a part of state's policy, controls and determines its budget with significant cost in many countries. In the age old system, the education and teaching were conducted mainly in the family. In the passing era from communal to slave system, the old traditions of family education were kept and then changed. 
The function of work of a teacher or even the art of the science of teaching itself were prerogative of patriarchal family, which were fixed in the literary monuments of ancient East. The schools and educational system of ancient East were developed in line with specific historical, cultural, moral, and ideological values. The human was formed within the rigid social regulators, responsibilities and personal dependence on others. The idea of individuality by humans was very poorly considered. The personality dissolved in the family, caste and social stratum, hence the reliance on strict forms and methods of education was present. The focus in teaching and education on the most ancient Eastern civilization was on the family, religious institutions and states. The reason for this is that the family was not able to provide a community with a sufficient number of people with experience in reading, writing and studying law. That was why the educational institutions created by a secular government and the religious became, began to teach the populace in order to supplement the officials. The transition period when the first human civilization arose is characterized by deep change in the practice of education and teaching. The ways of transmission of the cultural heritage of ancestors from adults to children changed qualitatively. There were special educational frameworks for teaching the younger generation. Moral education in ancient Egypt and Africa was conducted mainly through memorization and meditation of moralizing concepts like in Igbo language, we say gidi gidi bo ugweze, meaning the pride of a king is in the support of his kinsmen. Ajua, ajua, ala, ajo ewi. It means if you seek wisdom, consult with the elders. Reading, writing, and storing such instructions was not easy as they are expressed in the language of hieroglyphics that are different from living speech. The spirituality of concepts was key where they dwelt in that high level of engagement through prayer and meditation. The purpose and objective of education then was to prepare for activities that family members were traditionally engaged in. So the family was the basic unit of teaching. Musicians, artisans, priests, and so on, pass their professions or trade onto their children. Fathers, craftsmen sometimes use props and crafted toys in teaching their children. Models of agricultural implement, meals, forges, and so on. The military act was transferred strictly to specific classes, the families and the communities, our future soldiers were taught to use weapons, special exercises to develop strength, endurance, agility. So a family system with full involvement in education is vital to integrating our world. This now is where marriage is important and the marrying out of the bride. In Africa, when, when it's married, there's celebration, elation, joy. Now marriage brings integration of cultures and belief systems together, where we learn from one another, unite families, live together in harmony, and incorporate ideologies to develop into a peaceful world. This is a holy ground with sanctity. It means that you do not come into the marriage union with an intention to leave. Marriage is a safe ground for building a family relationship, which educates, sculptures, 
and forms a framework that molds our society. In today's world, we cannot successfully integrate our society, science and culture without the foundation of this union known as the institution of marriage. Another organized family system will produce a world of peace, joy, harmony, and inclusiveness. Science, society, and culture have now been introduced as seen above. Man in the realm of something more sublime than animal. He speaks, therefore, according to my previous explanation, the bridge between physical and the spiritual is accomplished. Man has been able to conquer his world as expected, but the divergence in his view and tolerance to integrate these key components is focus of our discussion. This has been a huge challenge in our world today. If you've noticed, whatever we have in the world today is said to be discovered or invented because it had always been in existence. Thomas Edison, who invented the incandescent light bulb, the phonograph and much more was held back from a formal school as a child. He was educated and trained by his mother at home. This family system is very important and hence leads us into our discussion of marriage. I look at the purpose of marriage and the role of society. The purpose and reason for marriage. We see two very important principles. Number one, marriage was instituted by a, a higher power or model and not man. Man was given the opportunity to make his choice in another human being. The second point is that the purpose of marriage is for you to be joined with one of the opposite gender who would help you fulfill your calling and the responsibilities in your life. Marriage is primarily to help you serve better and live a life worthy of connectedness in honor and dignity. The secondary reason for marriage includes having goodly seed, children, a goodly family is the smallest unit of your natal family. The second point is companionship. Companionship in this instance should not connote having someone physically by your side all the time, but someone of like mind who is working with you towards common goals, regardless of where he or she is physically located at any point in time. In ancient days, a big family was an advantage for industrialization and productivity because they were the workforce. They existed strong bonds and connections. The third point is abstaining from fornication. Marriage provides the avenue where legitimate sexual desires could be fulfilled effectively. Through these, Though these are the most common uh, stated reasons for marriage, there are secondary reasons and should not overshadow the primary purpose of marriage. Marriage is um, determined primarily by how involved in spiritual things that the parties are than by how old chronologically they are. So someone who is not yet accountable for specific responsibility it is in the house is not yet ready for marriage. Spiritual responsibility starts from the lower level. The first prerequisite is that you must be a responsible and consistent member of your family. If you cannot pass the faithfulness test at this level, you will never get bigger responsibilities. The second point, the role of the family. The family expects to be involved in relationship before uh, they are even contracted or they are among the first to be informed. For the man 
or, or for the young man that is getting married, uh, you should have received appropriate counsel from before proposing. And for the lady, you should also have received appropriate counsel before accepting. Why some marriages fail? That's our third point. As shocking as this may sound, it is not automatic for marriage between, as shocking as this may be, it is not automatic for marriage between good and nice people to work out. Just the same way as it is not automatic for every good person to be prosperous or healthy, etc. Though the provision has been made, so also it is with marriage. The number one cause of distress in home is ignorance. Ignorance of the responsibility of each member in that household. Marriage seminars can help couples, but are not the only solution. The need for the couples to find in their deep spiritual roots, answers to connection is paramount. This is why a marriage in which one or both parties do not have time to engage spiritually will end up with problems. Another related reason for the rising divorce, divorce rate is that couples try to build their marriage solely on the love they feel for each other. They assume that such love transcends all problems, so they do not bother to involve concepts of higher spiritual worth with their marriage decisions. Lastly, what about simple disagreement? We all need to work at compromise. We need to listen to the words and perceptives of the other spouse, rising above our personal egoism and allow him or her what comes from their own perspective and nature. This kind of respect for the order can lead to compromise, love and accomplishments, regardless of divergence in the ob obvious, uncorrected perceptions and properties in each partner. No one person is 100% right or wrong. We can develop a respect for another. Another's point of view, even if we feel a weakness in their perspective. After we have listened to their side, we can acknowledge it and add our personal thought and determine together a middle line that both can accommodate. In conclusion, solving the problem, our global problem of modernity through integration in society, science, and culture needs the application of integral wisdom and education with familiar roots in order to realize that we have to unite together in a mutual relationship of one love, irrespective of disposition, color, race, or geographical location. Thank you so much. Any question? I may ask you a question, but uh, you're a pastor, you know, so I hope you take you the time. Um, what about polygamy? This is an area, <clears throat> what do you think about it? Like in your culture, what is polygamy and your religion? Uh, is it accepted there? And if so, how do you practice it? Oh, all right. Uh, thank you so much for the question. Um, if I will narrow it to, if I narrow it to uh, the Christian beliefs, um, the Christian uh, believes in uh, one man, one woman, you know, uh, they believe in monogamy, but in a situation, because you see, in a situation where someone is not a Christian, you know, or was not one, because I'm telling you, um, you know, the practices, but in a situation where one uh, wasn't one, he comes into the fold and he is polygamous. Of course, you cannot throw away your family 
your family system is your family. Like the lecture I was given now um, in the, uh, you know, in the olden days, you know, um, a family is seen, in fact, a very productive family is the one that is big and is polygamous. Um, in the, um, uh, I don't want to go too much in religion, but in Christian, in Christ, in, in um, you know, in the Christian religion, in the Christ, in Christianity, you know, is one man, one woman. But in the Old Testament, you 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 know, you you can relate to that. Um, Abraham, which uh, which uh, Christians are the descendants of, you know, Abraham to Christ. Um, he, 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 he had a, a polygamous family, you know, and he, it was actually an advantage at the time, you know, uh, in a polygamous family, you, you have that workforce, like I mentioned, when you look at the family system, everybody is productive, everybody is trained and taught, and, you know, there is unity, there is harmony, you know, um, in that family. Um, I happen to come up from a polygamous family, a very big family, you know, uh, until my Christian beliefs. But if I narrow it to my belief in Christianity, is one man, one woman. I hope I answered your questions. Thank you. Thank you Any so other much. Questions? Thank you so much, Pastor. Um, if you do have any other questions, please post them in the chat and we will address them. Um, we do have a video, one more video that we'd like to share with you. It was the one that um, Dr. Kalechi wanted to show earlier. Um, and we will go to that right now. Thank you. barricaded the world with hate, has goose-stepped us into misery and bloodshed. We have developed speed, but we have shut ourselves in. Machinery that gives abundance has left us in want. Our knowledge has made us cynical, our cleverness hard and unkind. We think too much and feel too little. More than machinery, we need humanity. More than cleverness, we need kindness and gentleness. Without these qualities, life will be violent and all will be lost.
national barriers, to do away with greed, with hate and intolerance. Let us fight for a world of reason, a world where science and progress will lead to all men's happiness. Thank you so Thanks. much, Jeanette, for sharing this for me. And uh, that's all. Back to you, moderator. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Kalachi. Well, um, I think uh, we have gone over our time. Professor Fahim, um, would you like for us to address maybe one or two questions before we end? Actually, we really uh, have a very intensive uh, conference and I would like also, uh, only to uh, send my thanks to all the speakers and uh, to all uh, uh, moderators and the broadcast teams as well as uh, for uh, translators and uh, secretaries who really did a wonderful work and um, uh, I also hope that uh, we will have uh, even better day tomorrow. Please take into the consideration that the tomorrow session will start uh, at 13 uh, Israeli time and 12 uh, European time. Maybe uh, Alina will give us a clue what will be the time in United States when it will begin. Yes, uh, for Eastern Standard Time, New York City time, tomorrow, uh, Sunday, we will begin quite early. It will be uh, at six o'clock in the morning. Uh, for Central Europe, um, I believe we begin at, at noon and Israel time will be uh, at one o'clock. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, friends. And please uh, stay tuned, stay safe, and see you tomorrow. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.